Okay. Good morning, everyone. If you can find your seats, we'll get started. Welcome. How is everybody? Welcome back to Grace Bible Fellowship. We're in the book of Luke again today. Again? Yeah, we're in the book of Luke again today. And there are two things that Jesus does here which displays his incredible power. It shows that Jesus is in control. Regardless of what you find on CNN, NBC, CNBC, Jesus is in control. Amen? Amen. He is a tower. He's a deliverer like no other. Amen. We just sang that, so I hope it's true in your life. Before we, before we get into the book of Luke here in chapter 8, let's pray. Father, we want to take time to recognize your presence here and that we're unworthy, that every fiber of our being was conceived in sin and Lord, we live in a sinful world among sinful people. And yet, you have redeemed us by your blood. That you poured yourself into the form of a human being, became a perfect man, and died in our place. And you took the punishment that we all deserve and that we've earned. And because of that, you've changed our lives. You grant us you give us a call to come and be forgiven, to come and be changed, to come and stop all of the games and to be real with you. So, Lord, we want to do that with you this morning. We want to sense your power in our lives. We want to sense your power over the things that we say, the things that we think, the things that get lodged in our heart, the things that occupy our time and our hands. Lord, we want to give all these things to you. We want them all to glorify you. And Lord, we need your power to do that. So this morning, in each one of our hearts here, and anyone within the hearing of my voice, I pray that your spirit would bring light, that we might reflect you. So Lord, here we are. Use us in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're in the book of Luke chapter 8. There are two things that are going to happen here. Jesus is going to go on a three-hour tour with the disciples to a place called Gennesaret. He goes over the Sea of Galilee, which isn't really big. And there he has an appointment. So we're going to look at these two displays of the power of Jesus Christ. Just in case you forgot where you were. This is what we did last week. We looked at chapter 8, verses 1 to 21, the sower, the seed, and the soil. We looked at how Jesus tells a parable and how he likened human hearts to be like soil. He said some of the seed, which is the word of God, fell on the path. No chance. And the birds of the air come and take it and deliver it before you have any possibility of germination of that seed. And that's, those are the people that hear the word of God and the devil comes and takes it from them. And then there's a different kind of soil, which is shallow soil. And the shallow soil only might be four inches of soil and the rest of it's solid rock. And he says some of, the, some of this word of God will fall on this type of soil and it comes up quickly because it's on this rock that holds water. It doesn't drain very well. But because it doesn't have any root, when the heat comes up, when the sun rises and persecution and difficulty comes, it burns the seed up because it has no root. It's not the fault of the seed, it's the fault of the soil, which is us. And there are different types of soils that come in here every day. Even as it speaks of eternal, uh, eternal choices, accepting Jesus Christ, it happens as we hear the word of God too. We can choose to have a heart that's open and, and like the fertile soil, or we can have the cares and the worries of this world be pressing upon us like so many thorns that choke out the word of God. And we don't want that, right? No. Good. I'm glad I'm not the only one. And then 
we don't want to be like the rock that, you know, we, we're excited, you know, we worship and everything's fine and we leave and basically hard times come and then our faith is gone and it evaporates because we don't have a root in the Lord. So we have an opportunity to do all that or we can be like the path where the word of God comes in and it's like, I ain't got no time for that. Too busy. Got to go. So we looked at all of that. We looked at the women that supported Jesus, the ones that heard and followed and did what he said. They were the ones who had fertile soil in their heart and they followed Christ. Then he started talking about light and how light comes to us. Uh, I brought up the saying, uh, the, the blood of the covenant is thicker than the water of the womb. That's blood is thicker than water, what it actually means. Because Jesus is mother and his brothers and sisters came and they wanted to see him outside and he was in the midst of teaching and he said, who is my mother and my brothers and my sisters? He says, it's those who hear and do the will of God, tying right back into the soils again. And so we looked at this and Jesus shouts out, he who has an ear, let him hear, which is an exhortation to us that we should listen up and we should be all ears. That's what the Dumbo reference is. So that was last week. This week, we're going to look at these events that Jesus runs into. In Luke 8, 39, Jesus speaking to a man says, return to your own house and tell them the great things that God has done for you. And he went his way and he proclaimed throughout the whole city what great things Jesus had done for him. It's an amazing thing. I wonder if he would start the story by saying, you'll never guess who I met today. (laughs) Anyway, I always think of this episode like the, you know, when the weather started getting rough, the tiny ship was tossed. If not for the courage of the the crew, the minnow would be lost. The minnow would be lost. What a great choir you are. And the, uh, no, no, don't call me Skipper. The disciples are Skipper and uh, Gilligan because they act a lot like Skipper and Gilligan. So we're going to take a look at how this little three-hour tour, this little uh, happy little trails on the, the lake goes. It begins in verse 22. Now it happens on a certain day that he got into a boat with his disciples and said to them, let us cross over to the other side of the lake. And they launched out. But as they sailed, he fell asleep. (laughs) Slacker. (laughs) And a windstorm came down on the lake and they were filling with water And they were in jeopardy. And they came to him and awoke him saying, Master, Master, we are perishing. And he arose, rebuked the wind and the raging of the water, and they ceased. And there was calm. But he said to them, where is your faith? And they were afraid and marveled, saying to one another, who can this be? For he commands even the winds and the water to obey him. And that's a whole lot better than the weatherman because he can't control anything. In fact, he can't even guess. But don't get me started. <laughs> this is the Sea of Galilee, by the way. Beautiful, inviting photograph. Place where you might want to take a boat. But because of its location, unfortunately, Mount Hermon is there, which has uh, snow on top of it. The air will blow over the top of it. This is the second lowest lake on the face of the planet. So it's very, very low, but all this air travels over the mountains and catches the cold of the the snow and comes down and gets heated quickly and it causes the serious convection and swirling and uh, storms can come up very, very quickly. So it happens. But this was a bit of a different storm, I think. This would be the Sea of Galilee, which was known as Kinnereth. The reason they called it in ancient times Kinnereth is because it looks like that. And you have no idea what I'm talking about, but it looks like a harp. Actually, a hand, uh, you know, a harp. So that's why it was called Kinnereth. So 
That's the, the it, or the Sea of Tiberius, you might be familiar with that because Caesar Tiberius decided he would name it after himself because it was such a nice little pond outside his door. He named it for himself, not egotistical at all. So, so that's where they are and that's what they're doing. From the top of the story, now it happened on a certain day that he got into a boat with his disciples. Whose boat do you think it is? Peter's boat. Peter's a fisherman. Peter knows what he's doing. Jesus said, hey, let's go out. Peter's like, no problem. Got this, Lord. <laughs> and he said to them, let's cross over to the other side of the lake. It's about eight miles going across. So it's, it's a little bit of a workout. And they launched out. But as they sailed, he fell asleep. If you remember, Jesus has this habit. In fact, this is the only time in all of the scripture that Jesus sleeps. You see lots and lots of times where he stayed up all night praying. He stayed up all day ministering. He broke bread. He filled, you know, he fed thousands of people. He was always giving, always on point, always exuding out of him the power that God gave him for the other people, which is what Jesus does and what he calls us to do. But you see his humanity here because he doesn't have limitless power, does he? He needs sleep. This shows the humanity of Jesus. He's just like you and me. He gets tuckered out. He gets tired. Think he wants to wake up on Sunday morning? So he falls asleep. The only time that the Bible mentions he sleeps. I just think that's interesting. In Hebrews chapter 4, verses 15 and 16. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Amen. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace and help in time of need. You see, when you just don't have it, Jesus knows how you feel. Amen. When you're sick, Jesus knows how you feel. When you're tired, Jesus knows how you feel. When you have 12 knuckleheads in your boat that are all arguing, <laughs> Jesus knows how you feel. And when you're tired, Jesus knows how you feel. The beautiful thing is because of that, he gives us strength in those times when we're weak. In fact, sometimes I think that's why we have the weakness. Amen. Like Paul with the thorn in the flesh. And so he wouldn't become exceedingly prideful from all the things that he had seen. So the Lord gave him a thorn in the flesh, something that he didn't like, something that was painful, something that was a, a, a weakness. And he says, you know, I prayed about this three times and the Lord said, my grace is sufficient for you. Said that to Paul the apostle. I'm answering your prayer right here, Paul. No. Wow. My grace is enough for you. My strength is made perfect in your weakness. You see, it's when we're weak that we're really strong because then we're kind of dead to ourselves and we have nothing in our flesh to give. And we have to rely upon the Lord and cry out to him. I say, God, you got to help me here. I'm going to blow it. I'm going to go sin. I'm going to do something stupid. I'm, I'm going to fall out. I'm not going to get this thing done. I'm going to take shortcuts. I'm going to sleep in. I have to pray about all that stuff. I seem to have a lot of thorns. You probably have a couple of those too. But Jesus understands. And I, I think that's his perfect humanity. And I'm so glad because he sympathizes with our weaknesses. Amen. And a windstorm came down on the lake. And they were filling with water. And they were in jeopardy. Not, not the game show. And they came to him and awoke saying, Master, Master, we're perishing. Luke is cleaning it up a little bit. We, luckily, this is in three of the four Gospels. And so we get to see it in Matthew, and we get to see it in Luke here, and we get to see it in Mark. Some of the words that are used exactly are a little bit more dramatic. So uh, Luke is trying to, you know, change the names to protect the innocent. You know, they, he just didn't want everybody to know everything. But he basically is trying to tell a story to show the power of Jesus Christ. And so he doesn't give all the details. 
But we do have some of the other details from Mark, who, by the way, is basically the guy who penned according to Peter. As Peter dictated to him, Mark wrote this thing out, and they call it the Gospel of Mark. It's really the Gospel of Peter, because he writes it. Mark, Mark writes it, but Paul dictates it. Not Peter dictates it. Sorry. Lord, I'm tired. Help me. Mark 4.38 puts it this way, but he was in the stern asleep on a pillow. Do you, do you hear the, the little bit of a mock in there? There was a storm. We were working it, man. It was, you were trying to keep the boat under control, but we were going down. But he was asleep on a pillow. You, the, the soft pillow kind of, I don't know, maybe it's because I'm sarcastic from Jersey, but there it is. He's asleep on a pillow. And they awoke him and said to him, teacher, do you not care that we're perishing? You see, Luke gives you the essence of it, but Peter is basically telling us the emotion of it. Don't you care? Can you imagine saying that to anyone? No less Jesus. You know what it's like when you're working and somebody's not working and maybe they're slacking off or they're just sitting there doing nothing. And you're like sweating. And they're sitting there going, wow, look at you. You're really working hard. Look at you. You want to go over and say, why don't you help me already? Well, that's kind of, I think that was the spirit of what Peter did. And I think it was Peter because that's just the way Peter is. Or maybe that's just the way I am. And I think Peter's like me. So <laughs> teacher, do you not care that we're perishing? Because he's asleep. I wonder. Have you ever had a really bad storm in your life and you wonder where Jesus is? Oh, man. Lord, do you see what I'm going through? Are you sleeping? Do you care? We do that sometimes. We don't have our eyes on him. We have our eyes on us. So, overwhelming fear and feeling of powerlessness tests our faith and reveals our frailty. It's when times are tough and we have difficult times in our life, we have storms in our life, we have hardship in our life, when we don't have enough money to pay the bills, when we don't have enough strength to do something we need to do, or we don't have breath after COVID, or, you know, whatever it is that you lack, it's going to show really, it's like toothpaste, you know, you squeeze it, you get to see what's inside. I just recently got through some toothpaste that was completely black. It had charcoal in it. It was okay. It had charcoal in it. it was, it's good for me. So opinionated, you people. So I don't think I'll get it again. But anyway, that's the only way you're going to know what you have in the, t in the tube, right, is when you squeeze it and it starts coming out. And you might be surprised. It might be tricolored or it might be, you know, crest. It's all white. But it was surprising to see it was black. I already knew what was inside. Just like Jesus does. Sometimes we don't. So what happens is a little bit of pressure and suddenly you start seeing things come out of you that you didn't know were in there. Amen? Amen. What a cool thing that the Lord shows mercy to us in putting just enough pressure, not that we're going to burst, Amen. but enough that we get to see what's still inside and what needs to be addressed. It brings it up to the top and then you can deal with it. Even the strongest Christian can fail in their faith when placed in the furnace of affliction. I, I think I stole that from Spurgeon, or at least part of it. In the furnace of affliction, when there's difficulty, it's designed to burn off the junk in our lives, but very often what happens is it just shows us how weak we are. But at least we can take care of it then. And so after being awakened so rudely... I'm sure Jesus rubbed his eyes and kind of got his bearings and tried to get his legs under him. And then he arose and he rebuked the wind and the raging of the water and they ceased. And there was calm. Like that. There again, Luke is telling us the story to tell us about the power 
and the humanity of Jesus Christ. Mark, writing from Peter's perspective, says, And he arose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. That's a little bit more color in the story. If you look at the original language, the word peace means silence. Be muzzled. That's what be still means. Like you're telling a dog to put a muzzle on. Like, shut up if I could be so bold. Cut it out and shut up. Don't say that to someone else. But to the wind and the waves, you could do that. And Jesus did. He used very strong language. In fact, it's the same stuff when the demons are inside of people and they begin to speak and he tells them to stop. He says, be muzzled. And that's the end of that. The disciples do the very same thing. Be muzzled. And everything was tranquil and quiet and calm. That's an incredible power, is it not? I know I can't control the weather like that. But he said to them, where is your faith? Seconds ago, they were all freaking out. And they were afraid and marveled, saying to one another, who can this be? You see, they followed Jesus as a rabbi, but they were like, who is this guy? Because we don't really know. Isn't it amazing, the more dramatic things that happen in your life, the more of Christ that gets revealed to you? Yes. And the more hardship and the more difficulty and the more he puts you kind of up front, the more you get to know the power and the love of our God. And here is one of these things where they say, I, who is he? Who is this guy? Even the wind and the waves obey him. I can tell you who he is. This is God, the Son. God poured into a human flesh, a perfect life, sacrificed for your sin, which he offers to you freely. Mark 4.40 says, But he said to them, Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? Mark kind of zeroes in, or Peter speaking to Mark, zeroes in on this. Why are you so fearful? You know, that's a good question, isn't it? You know, God is not a God of fear, but of love and power and a sound mind, it says in Timothy. So why are we afraid? We're afraid because we don't trust him. We're afraid because we forget he loves us. Even in our stupidity and our shortcomings and our frail failures, and he still loves us. And we forget that. And so we think it's all on us. And it's funny, as I was studying this last night and I was in the office, I heard this loud noise. And I turned and I was shocked, but I noticed I wasn't afraid. And the Lord spoke to my heart. He goes, you know why you're not afraid? Because you know I'm here. Is Jesus in your boat? Because if Jesus is in your boat, it doesn't matter what happens and what comes. You might want to call on him early <laughs> and not wait until you're sinking. No, we got this. Why? Don't bother him. He's on a pillow. We got this. No, 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 no. Go to him often. Go to him early. Go to him on your knees. Ask, call people. Hey, pray for me. And then when the Lord does an incredible work, then we're all in on it. Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? No faith. Jesus said they have no faith. He didn't say little faith. He said, you got, you got none. Zero. Because I think Peter was at the helm trying to handle everything. I got this. I can, I can do this. I can juggle and, and cook on the stove. You know, I can do all of this all by myself. Not in your own power, you can't. And not without getting a bad heart. But with the power of Christ, we can do all things who God who strengthens me, right? Deuteronomy 31.8 says, And the Lord, he is one who goes before you. 
He will be with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. Do not fear nor be dismayed. I have a feeling that there are some of you in this room who struggle with fear. Do you know what the statistics tell us? It's a function of the hippocampus. And do you know depression is usually suffered more by females than males? Yes. The most violent people in the world are men. Aren't you proud of that? The majority of criminals are men. Violent crime, men. But depression is very female. And it's because you have compassion. Compassion. The price of compassion is you can worry because you love somebody so much you worry. Sorry, I just went into men's retreat mode. Forgive me. <laughs> I will never leave you or forsake you. You know that's a promise? Amen. Do not fear nor dismay. You know that's a command. Do not fear or be dismayed. That's something that we're told to do. We have to be obedient to that, which means there's some effort on our part that we have to make this happen. So what do you do when you're afraid? You better be quoting scripture. That's what I do. I can tell you the sword of the Lord is the best thing to pull out when you're in the middle of that. What does the word say? I will never leave you or forsake you. Do not be afraid or dismayed. The more scripture you know, the more that you're going to have as far as ammunition is concerned. Psalm 118, 5 and 6 says, I called on the Lord in distress. The Lord answered me and set me in a broad place. A broad place means a nice open area where you're not hemmed in and trapped. No claustrophobia. And the Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do to me? What are you going to do to me? Who's in control? The Lord's in control. So what are you going to do to me? You're going to do to me whatever it is that the Lord allows you to do to me. And you know what? I'm okay with that because my father's in control, not me. You know what happens when we're in control? We do a bad job. Like Peter driving the boat. We wait to the last second before we're going under to call on the Lord. <coughs> Get off your pillow. Don't you care? Forgive us, Lord. I'm calling this guess who I met today. <laughs> and they sailed to the country of the Gadarenes. Uh, by the way, that's the land of Gennesaret. It's uh, on the other side, which is the opposite of Galilee. And then he stepped out on the land and met him a certain man from the city. Oh, he must have had an appointment. It must have been a business appointment. <laughs> who had demons for a long time. And he wore no clothes, nor did he live in a house, but in the tombs. Can you imagine if Jesus told them actually what he had planned when he said, let's get in the boat and go for a ride. A uh, three hour tour. And they get in the boat and then there's this incredible storm and he comes the storm and they get to the other side and he has an appointment with a demon-possessed man. Actually, Matthew brings out the fact that there were two of them, but there's one who's the main speaker, and this is the memorable one. He's naked. Have you ever talked to a naked person? I don't care if you're in a ladies' locker room and you're a lady. I don't care if you're a man. Men in the bathroom don't talk to each other. It is an unwritten rule. Somebody's in the stall and you're at the urinal, no conversation unless there is a deep, dark emergency. Man, am I right? Okay. Because I hear the ladies in the later room. They could both be sitting and, you know. You know, they're, they're, and they're having conversations. We hear it out here. <laughs> anyway. Sorry. I'm very tired. 
Jesus is going to have a conversation with a guy who's demon possessed. For, so if you ever talk to somebody that you think is demon possessed, there's a level of fear, right? Because you have absolutely no idea what they're going to do. And it's funny because Jesus said, where's your faith? Why are you afraid? And he's bringing them to meet a demon possessed guy. That was only the training for this event. You realize that? And anything you're going through, know it, it's training for another event. Anything we're going through is training for the next event. Don't think it's an end. It's training for the next event. So he goes to this place where you've got kind of the Jews that decided they didn't want to go into the land and take it. They stayed on the, the, the tribe of Gad on this side. They didn't want to go in and, you know, it's too much trouble to cross the water and go around. You know, let's just stay here. The grass is nice. It's, we like this area. Why do we have to go in? They had to go in and conquer the land and then they were able to come back. They left their wife and children and flocks and stuff. So these folks are not like, you know, diehard, solid Jews. They're kind of, and you'll see because they heard pigs, which Jewish boys don't do. They sailed to the country of the Gadarenes, which is opposite Galilee, and they stepped out on the land and met a man from the city. It's interesting we get that little note from Luke. Who had demons for a long time. Demons for a long time. Does, do you have to say demons for a long time? He could have just got one yesterday, and that would have been enough. He had demons for a long time. I don't know if you've met anyone struggling with demonic activity, but the longer it goes, the worse they are. The more they hurt themselves, the more they have criminal records, the more likely they are to be homeless. It just gets worse. This guy's got nothing. He's at the end. He's burned every bridge soiled every relationship he's ever had. He is full-time naked, outdoors. That's what demon possession will do to you. you have, there's no security. There's, there's no privacy. There's no anything. You're full-time naked. Totally homeless. Because who's going to deal with them? Who's going to deal? Hey, we've got this guy. He's demon possessed. Can, can he come stay with you for the night? He lives among the dead. He doesn't have a house. He lives in the tombs. He lives among dead bodies in caves, naked. Demon possessed. Sound familiar? You may not have had this physically, but I'll bet you've experienced this spiritually. You know what it is where everybody looks at you and they size you up in an instant because they know who you are and what you're about because of the things that come flying out of your mouth and because of your attitude. You're full-time naked. Everybody sees you. Everybody knows where you're at. Everybody knows what your problem is. When you're demon-possessed, you can't keep that stuff a secret. The demons don't want it secret. And you work yourself into homelessness. And then the only people that want to spend time with you are dead people. I come out of that life. Amen. But I met Jesus. Amen. And then he saw Jesus. And he cried out, fell down before him, and with a loud voice said, What have I to do with you, Jesus, son of the most high God? Jesus got recognized. You remember the disciples just a moment ago on a boat said, who is this man? The demons know. It's interesting. What kind of faith does a demon have? They know that Jesus Christ is the son of the living God. Well, how come they're not going to heaven? Because it's not about what you say. It's what you do. Do you rely upon? Do you have faith in? In. Do you trust him completely with your life? That is what it is to know that Jesus is the most high God is when you trust him in everything in your life. The demon, 
I beg you, do not torment me. For he commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. You see, he tells him to come out. And then he responds to him and he says, don't cast me out. Don't torment me. Don't, don't beat me before the time. Isn't that curious? The demons are at his mercy. He's in control, not them. They're not writing the ticket. They're pleading with Jesus as to what can be done with them. You're not here to torment me before the time, are you? You're not here to lock me up and throw me into the abyss, are you? And Jesus goes to cast the demon out. And the demon responds by, don't destroy me. Whoa, the demon didn't go immediately? This is one of those instances where Jesus has to get a little more information. There were a couple of other situations like that when he was on the Mount of Transfiguration and came down. Disciples couldn't cast the demon out. And Jesus started asking questions. How, how long has your son been this way? What's his behavior been? <laughs> like a doctor, right? He gets the information and then he casts the demon out and the demon's gone. But he had to get some information first. I find that interesting. Here, he told the demon to leave and the demon pleaded with him not to be thrown into the abyss. Interesting. For he had often seized him, was kept under guard, bound with chains and shackles, and he broke the bonds and was driven by a demon into the wilderness. Wow, Jesus knows how to pick him, doesn't he? This demon knows his destiny and pleads that he wouldn't be thrown into the abyss. Jesus does not ask. He tells him. Human efforts to restrain him were unsuccessful. You know, maybe he went to a couple of programs. Maybe he went to AA. You know, maybe he went to NA. Maybe he went to all the A's. <laughs> These things are unable to bind him. They're unable to keep him. Shackles couldn't keep him. You're talking about supernatural power. You're talking about a guy who's an animal. Sound familiar? Does to me. Demons drive people into seclusion. You know, and sin will do the same thing with us. If when we decide we're going to take sin into our lives, it drives us away from people. It'll keep you away from church. It'll stop you from reading the word. Um, It'll keep you off your knees. And ultimately, demons, their job, their project in you is to be like a thief who doesn't come but accept to steal and to kill and destroy. Jesus says, I have come that they may have life, that they may have it more abundantly. So I've come that they might have life and that life more abundantly. You see, because the life you have before Jesus isn't really life. You're just marking time until judgment. Jesus asked him saying, what is your name? You have to wonder, is he speaking to the man or the demon? And he said, legion, because many demons had entered him. And they begged him that he would not command them to go out into the abyss. You see, Jesus just learned there's not just one. There's a bunch. And they're kind of tag teaming him. He's had many demons, had pants tense, which means they've come and gone. That's a pretty good picture of a whacked out guy talking to Jesus. Demons plead and are powerless in the presence of Jesus. Do you know that? There is no presence of evil on this world that will ever be able to take you down unless you let it. Because Jesus is in control. In Ephesians 6, 12, it says, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Guys, you think your problem is with a person. You think your problem's with a job. You think your problem's with the government. You think your problem's with the governor. You think your problem, your problem isn't with people. It's with spiritual forces. You get that? So don't take it out on the vessel necessarily. 
because you can pray and God can change things. By the way, a legion is 5,000 soldiers. You know, I picture him like, like all of the scary movies do. Our name is Legion, you know, speaking in some crazy voice. So Jesus has some information. Now a herd of swine was feeding there on the mountain. Oh, what a sweet picture that is. Uh, they, they bring stink wherever they go. And so they begged him that he would permit them to enter them. Take care of two things at once. And he permitted them. And the demons went out of the man and entered the swine. And the herd ran violently down the steep place into the lake and were drowned. By the way, demons, evil spirits, do never inhabit structures. They don't inhabit your car regardless of whether it starts. They don't infest a chair or a house because you're buried on an Indian grave round, you know. <laughs> flesh. Demons want flesh. Inhabit flesh. Now, you might have a mean dog, but it doesn't necessarily mean he's full of demons. And so they, they get cast out and they go into these demons. Uh, the demons go into the pigs and the pigs go off the edge. They go over the edge. Suicide. <laughs> Deviled ham. This is the day when pigs could fly. There is a picture of one that's actually rolling, that would be pork roll. This has been your comedic moment <laughs> to wake all of you up who are asleep. So Jesus consents and they go into the pigs and they go over. First of all, what are a bunch of good Jewish people hurting pigs for? Taking care of two things at once. And that's going to hurt them economically, isn't it? So, when those who fed them, meaning the pigs, saw what had happened, they fled, well, there's nothing else to do, and told it in the city and in the country. So they went and told everybody. Tattletales. Then they went out to see what had happened and came to Jesus and found the man from whom the demons had departed sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind. One meeting with Jesus, he's completely changed and he's wearing clothes. And they were afraid. I would think amazed might be a better word, but the word is afraid. Uh-oh, the son of God is here. Their reaction tells you much more about what's going on in their heart than it does about this man. They're afraid. I mean, if Jesus were to walk in this room and set his eyes on you, would it be joy, fear, amazement, humility? Like the song, I could only imagine. Yeah. Or will I dance? You know, what will I do? Well, these guys saw Jesus and were afraid. That says much more about what's going on in their life, doesn't it? And that's why we don't come to church when things aren't doing well. We don't get on our knees. We don't open the word. Because we're afraid God's going to speak to us. And we're going to have to deal with our mess. After meeting Jesus, the man is in full control of himself. He's no longer under the control of demons. And imagine how thankful this guy must be. I don't know what it's like to be possessed by demons. Possessed, taken over, owned by, ruled by. I know what it is to be filled with the spirit. And that's pretty cool. But to be controlled by demons and made to do things that somewhere in your heart of hearts and somewhere in the back of your mind, you're despising yourself for doing. 
and finally free so that you don't have to do those things that rule you. By the way, that's what Jesus still does today. He frees us so we don't have to do the things that the sinful nature tells us what to do. We do those things that the Lord tells us what to do because the Spirit of God has come into our hearts. Amen? Amen. It's good to be free. People are terrified when people see redemption if they don't want it. If you have joy and you start talking to somebody about Christ and they don't know Christ, they're either going to be curious, angry, or afraid. They're going to be curious and they'll ask you more questions. And then you have an opportunity to share life-giving information. The biggest decision that they have to make for all eternity is what they do with Jesus. Or they'll get mad at you. And that's okay. You ever had anybody mad at you? I still have people mad at me. There's not much I can do about that. And if there is, I, I try to fix that. But if I can't, sucks to be you. I, I'm a cold, heartless man, but I'm tired. People are terrified when they see redemption and they don't want it. So don't be surprised. Verse 36, they also who had seen it told them by what means he had been demon possessed, he was healed. And the whole multitude of the surrounding region of the Gadarenes asked him to depart from them. For they were seized with great fear. And he got in the boat and he returned. These guys heard about how Jesus cast out these demons, how they went into the pigs, and this guy is now in his right mind. And they said, please leave. Jesus, please, we, we don't want you around here. You remember Peter said something like that to him. Jesus leaves because they tell him to. And what a scary thing that is, that when you can tell Jesus to leave your life, and he will. And we don't have a recorded anything that ever comes back. And that's the scary thing. Even us who know the Lord Jesus Christ and who are Christians, it says, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God in which you were sealed into the redemption. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit because eventually he'll just, he'll zip it and you'll be on your own. And you'll wake up one day and say, how in the world did I get here? Trust me, I know. He's a gentleman. And so he did as they asked. And God's the same way. He won't force himself on you. That's called rape. That means that Jesus took this journey just for him. Jesus said, let's get in the boat. Let's go for a little three-hour tour. Jesus caught a little shut-eye. Had to wake up and cast the storm out and get it muzzled. And they went over there just for this guy. Jesus went out of his way, dragging 12 ignorant disciples with him in a boat across the sea, eight mile trip for this guy. I wonder if Peter and Andrew and James and John, these guys were fishermen and they fished on the other side in Galilee and it's eight miles across. I'll bet you could hear these guys screaming and yelling and all of the stuff that was going on on the other side, because across water, you know how sound travels like that? Now you can go out to Sandy Hook, and there could be somebody a couple miles out, and you can hear them talking. I wonder how they, I wonder how they reacted when they actually saw the people that were the ones making the noise. You know, if you ever find somebody that's demon-possessed, you know, you don't have anything to worry about. Because he who's in you is greater than he who's in the world. And you don't need to worry about it. Definitely get some help. Get a tag team partner. So Jesus leaves. Now the man from whom the demons had departed begged him that he might be with him. He wanted to join. But Jesus sent him away. Saying, return to your own house and tell what great things God has done for you. Who did these things for him? God. And he went his way and proclaimed throughout the whole city 
what great things Jesus had done for him. And I wonder if he said, guess who I met today? I wonder if he had a wife. I wonder if he had kids. I wonder if he went home. I wonder if he had parents. You know, I doubt he stuck his head through the door and said, I'm back. <laughs> the question is, who had to give up their clothes so the guy wouldn't be naked? I ask lots of questions so that when you ask me, I have an answer. I don't have an answer for that one, so. 2 Timothy 4.18 says, And the Lord will deliver me from every evil work and preserve me for his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. These are the last words of Paul the Apostle before he was beheaded. And the Lord will deliver me from every evil work and preserve me for his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. We can trust Jesus. It doesn't matter what your storm is. It doesn't matter what people you have in your life that you think are the problem. They're really not the problem. You can trust Jesus. Amen. Amen. Amen.